Dean of the School of Journalism and Communication, and I am uh, happy to welcome you to this year's uh, Rule Lecture, and I thank you all for, for joining us. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting day for the discussion of journalism and ethics on the University of Oregon campus. I mean, this, this morning we gave our Payne Awards for Ethics and Journalism. Uh, we have the Rule Lecture this afternoon, and then I suspect there's some in the room who will be going to hear Noam Chomsky tonight with a whole entirely different take on on media, and uh, uh, anyway, very, a very interesting day, uh, and, and quite rich for all of us, I think. For nearly half a century, Pulitzer Prize winner Robert W. Rule was one of Oregon's most respected newspaper journalists. Rule, who died in 1967, was the editor and publisher of the Mail Medford Mail Tribune. He performed his duties with a high sense of responsibility to the public and with uncompromising ethics. And I thought, in part, a uh, comment that was made at this morning's uh, presentation of the Payne Awards by Stanley Nelson, who won a Payne Award for his coverage of a, uh, a, a, a civil rights era murder uh, that his, he and his newspaper investigated many years later, that it was worth spending just a moment uh, going back and looking at, at the time period in which Robert Rule worked and in the Oregon history of that time let me just pause for a second. In describing Robert Rule's career, one source writes, Rule's first major challenge, having, after coming to Medford and buying the Mail Tribune, came with the meteoric rise of the state's Ku Klux Klan in the early 1920s. A Unitarian Republi and Republican, the urbane Rule battled the Klan's anti-Catholic school bill referendum, its rank political opportunism, and the action of its local vigilantes. As a result, his newspaper suffered significantly from a Klan organized boycott by advertisers and, subscri and subscribers. This was in the early 1920s. Later, in the early 1930s, when there was uh, uh, the rise of, of uh, grassroots movements in throughout Oregon and throughout the country, um, another source said, quote, that a particular political figure Built, built a political power base based on the <clears throat> November 1932 elections, relentlessly harassing longtime political figures, and then noted that political rest reached mob-like proportions. Those were the days talent resident uh, Harold Thornley observed, quote, that every time a car would backfire at night, everyone would crawl under the bed. On March 16, 1933, Constable George Prescott went to the bank's home to serve an arrest warrant. Banks shot Preston, who died instantly. The Medford Mail Tribune wrote the next day, quote, Banks welded a fiery pen and shot accusations and allegations against citizens, officials, and organizers. He used his paper for furtherance of political and personal vengeance. I read this because in th at this lecture, for as many years as I've been uh, introducing the rule lecture, I've noted that the Medford Mail Tribune won the 1934 Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished and Meritorious Public Service. But I think that the, the context of the time suggests that that Pulitzer Prize for Meritorious Service was quite extraordinary, and that Robert, Robert uh, Rule, as some, some of the people we honor today and as the lecturer we're about to hear, uh, put their lives on the line uh, to serve the public interest and to do good journalism. The Rule's Rule Lecture was established in 1973 by Mabel Rule, Robert's widow. And it is designed to bring to campus a distinguished American journalist who de delivers a public lecture on an issue of significance for contemporary journalism. The Rule Lectures have helped the School of Journalism and Communication achieve Mrs. Rule's expressed hope that the symposium would contribute, quote, to the development of students into dedicated journalists. I feel it is especially important today that we restore to this field of journalism a greater sense of ethics, responsibility, and dedication. Uh, Mabel Rule said that in 1974, and we continue to believe that uh, there is an urgency in creating a greater sense of ethics, responsibility, and dedication. Yesterday and today, we have been, re been reading and hearing reports about the deaths of photojournalists Chris Hondros and Tim Hetherington in Libya. One was a shooter for Getty Images, and the other was an Oscar-nominated producer uh, for a documentary chronicling a U.S. Army unit's battle in Afghanistan. This news is a horrific reminder to all of us that journalism in many parts of the world is a life-threatening occupation. 
In February 2008, Jerry Van Dyke, an American journalist and author, was researching a book on in, in Afghanistan when he crossed into the dangerous tribal areas on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, penetrating a no-man's land where Western journalists hadn't ventured for years. He was captured along with three guides by the Taliban and spent 45 days in captivity confined to a one-room cell. His captors hoped to exchange Van Dyke for money and prisoners held by, held by the United States at Guantanamo Bay. It is an ordeal chronicled in his book, Captive, Prisoner of the Taliban. Jerry is also the author of another book, In Afghanistan, An American Odyssey, uh, <clears throat> which was an account of his travels with the Mahajin in, 1980, in the 1980s during their struggle against the Soviet Union. He has covered stories all over the world for the New York Times, CBS News, and National Geographic that have required him to visit places where few Western reporters have ventured before. And I might note, if you read his work, you, you see quite clearly the, the passion that takes him to dangerous places and his desire to uh, inform the public. Before he ventured into dangerous places, Jerry grew up in the Portland area and came to the UO to run track for some guy named Bowerman. Um, he is a 1968 University of Oregon graduate in political science, but he did find his way to journalism, and we're proud of that. And Jerry, while we, I guess we're not quite in the shadows of Hayward Field, but we're very happy to welcome you back to the University of Oregon, and please, please welcome Jerry Van Dyke. Thanks, Tim, very much. Yes, I feel like I'm home. Before I begin, I want to say that at the end of this talk, I'm going to leave time for questions. And I want to ask each and every one of you, please do not hesitate to ask anything that's on your mind. I have found in my talks that some of the most innocently seeming questions from high schoolers or others go to the very heart of what is extremely important. Please remember that. About 10 months ago, <clears throat> I was sitting in a television studio in Manhattan doing what is called in the television business a two-way. I was sitting in a chair looking into a, a monitor. It was at Al Jazeera English, similar to the BBC. In Doha, there was the host. 10,000 miles away in Kabul was a man named Abdul Zalim Zaif. Mr. Zaif, some of you may recall, just after 9-11, held forth every single day in the Afghan embassy in Pakistan. He was the Afghan ambassador to Pakistan. While journalists from around the world were waiting to find out if the United States was going to invade, if Mullah Omar was going to give up Osama bin Laden. So the questions went back and forth, and we answered them as we do. And then the moderator asked Mr. Zaif, Mr. Zaif, what was it like being a prisoner of the Americans? And then he turned to me, and he said, Mr. Van Dyke, what was it like being a prisoner of the Taliban? And 10,000 miles became 10 feet. And Zaif started to talk, and he grew angrier and angrier, and became ever more emotional. And the moderator couldn't get him to be quiet. And he kept going and going and going. And he finally just stopped, and he came to me. And I said a few things. And Zaif interrupted, and he kept going and going. And finally, they had to cut it off. There is a quote from Nietzsche, which goes, after the disaster, the disaster begins. My story begins tonight. In 1968, as Dean Gleason said, when I was a senior here in college, the Vietnam War was raging. I didn't know what I was going to do. We had to worry about the draft, whether we should go to Canada, whether we should go to jail, whether we should go in the Army, whether we should go to graduate school, whether we should get married. I signed up for the Peace Corps. I was trying to, at that time, running seriously, trying to make the 68 Olympic team. I was consumed with track. 
Bobby Kennedy came to this campus, Eugene McCarthy, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were killed. It was an extremely tumultuous time. Graduated, went home, I got a draft notice, and I got a Peace Corps assignment to be a PE teacher in Afghanistan. Where is Afghanistan? Somewhere in Asia, it's far away and lonely sounding. Tried to make the team, I didn't make it. I was discouraged, sad, but I couldn't go against my father. I couldn't join the Peace Corps. I knew I had to go in the military, but the draft board gave me an extension to try and to make the team. So I had a few months and I took off and all travel is escape and pursuit in equal parts. I hitchhiked through Europe, as maybe many of you have done or will do, came down to the Mediterranean, looked across, I hadn't gone far enough, crossed, took a boat across into Morocco and entered the world of Islam. Why did I embark upon this venture? Because at Oregon, I studied political science, I took journalism classes, I took a French class, I took a writing class, and one of the last days of school, I took a class called Peoples of the World, an anthropology class. And I remember so clearly watching a documentary called The Blue Men of Morocco, these men who wore turbans, rode camels and crossed the Sahara. And I walked out of class with a woman named Jimmy Lugat, a senior, and I said, I want to go ride with the Tuareg. She said, I want to come with you. To this day, I kind of regret saying no. Why the Tuareg? I didn't know it at the time, just like I didn't know what I was going to do. They reminded me of the Indians that I studied in school here when I grew up on the Columbia River, or the time that my father took me to the Pendleton Roundup and I watched the young Braves race. They were the call of the wild, so different from the deeply fundamentalist Christian Plymouth Brethren, Plymouth Brethren sect in which I grew up. I have a psychological understanding, which I developed since I was a boy, of fundamentalism. I didn't know it at the time. I went in the Army, got out, went to graduate school on the GI Bill in Paris. Afterwards, everybody, all my friends said, oh, I want to go, now I want to be a doctor, I want to go be a lawyer, or I want to do this, I want to do that. I said, I want to go to Afghanistan. Why? I didn't know. I called my parents in Vancouver, and I asked my mother, who answered the phone, if my younger brother could drop out of college, he had just finished high school, and join me, because I wanted to buy an old Volkswagen and travel across Asia together. I wanted adventure. I wanted romance. To this day, my brother and I do not know why she said yes. We got to Afghanistan, and I said, this is the place I've been looking for. But we were out of money. We had no more. We had a car accident, and many things happened. And so we lived in Kabul, which in 1973 was a world where schoolgirls, dressed like Catholic schoolgirls in the US, short skirts, long socks, Scarves laughed in the streets. There were outdoor cafes, movie theaters. My brother tells me there was a discotheque, the smell of hashish and sewage and wood-burning stoves. Long camel caravans came slowly through the streets. There were 5,000 hippies in Kabul at that time. You could hear the rolling stones mixed with the evening call to prayer. It was the Wild West in the East. One day I went out with a Kuchi nomad caravan. They didn't have anything, but they invited me into their home. And I was so taken by how feminine the woman was that she walked from one edge of the tent to the next, and she got tea with sugar, all that they had. It was my introduction to what is called Pashtun Wali. The Pashtuns are the largest ethnic group in the world without their own homeland, larger than the Kurds. The Pashtuns are the founders of modern-day Afghanistan, the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan. About 12, 000, 12 million in Afghanistan. There has never been a census to this day in Afghanistan. About 12 million Pashtuns, about 15 million at least, 20 million more likely across the border in Pakistan. The Taliban are Pashtuns. Pashtun Wali, the tribal code which means the way of the Pashtuns or Pashtunism. One of the most important tenets of which is to treat a guest like a king. They gave me all that they had. It was
was the romance of Asia. It was the Tuareg, the nomads, the Nez Perce, the Indians around here, but I didn't know it then. That same time, the brother-in-law and first cousin of the king of Afghanistan overthrew him, creating a republic, setting in motion events that would lead directly to 9-11. Twelve young men, no more than 25 years old at the most, deeply religious young Muslim men, fled across the border to Pakistan, to Peshawar, where the Pakistani army, a guy named Nasr al-Babar, later became Benazir Bhutto's interior minister, took them in secretly, gave them code names, the milkman, the baker, the electrician. Two years later, in 1975, they launched their first attack into Afghanistan, and they called themselves the Mujahideen, which means holy warrior. I was back in, in came back home. My brother went to college. My mother forgave me. And I worked with Senator Henry Jackson in Washington, D.C. for a while. But I didn't like it. I didn't like the politics. I didn't like all the paperwork. I still wanted out. I wanted to do something. 1979, I was home here in Vancouver watching the evening news on television. I saw the Soviet tanks roll into Kabul, and I said, I have to go back. I was still living in Washington, D.C. I didn't say anything to anybody. And I got the, I got the, the booklet that lists all the bureau chiefs in Washington, and I just went down the list. On the 11th phone call to the New York Times, they said, come up, we'll talk to you. Took me in, a man named Bob Semple, foreign editor, after a couple of days of talking. And we're sitting in this, in this office, and he said, you know, I meet a lot, of sh a lot of charlatans in this business. How do I know you're telling me the truth? How do I know he is saying that we can trust you? And I, one of the fellows there, a young man who was on the foreign desk, followed track. He knew my name. I said, we've been talking about sports. Camus said, all I know about ethics, I know from sports. I said, fine. Next day, they gave me a check for $500 and a, and a letter and said, you can go out and have the best time of your life tonight in New York. You can apply it to a ticket to Pakistan and get there and turn around and come back. It's yours. Do whatever you want. They trusted me. I went to Pakistan. I met the, the South Asia bureau chief, Mike Coffin, from the New York Times. He took me up into the mountains. We looked across into Afghanistan, and he said, don't worry about the story. It will come to you. And it gave me comfort. I was scared. I was nervous. I had never done anything like this in my life. I went up along the border in Peshawar, and of the 12 men who escaped across the border, they now were leaders of the various Mujahideen parties, backed by Pakistan and the United States. I went to each one, not knowing what I was going to do, and I, a man named Hekmatyar, I didn't trust, a man named Rabani, whom I didn't like. And then I came to an old man named Khalas, bandolier and rifle, gray beard. He reminded me of cousins of mine who were farmers up in Almsville that we used to go visit on Sundays. He sent me in, down into the tribal areas, up into Pakistan, Afghanistan to live with a man named Haqqani. Haqqani, when I came to his compound, gave me honey to go with my tea. For a month, I lived with him, and he treated me like a king. Haqqani today is the most lethal, the most powerful, the most effective Taliban leader. Charlie Wilson, of Charlie Wilson's War, said he's the epitome of kindness. And before, he, until the day he died, he refused to say a bad thing about him. The Connie was a very close ally of the CIA. One day, there was a man, an Egyptian army major named Rahman, who came and stayed with us. And he hated me because I was an American. And he was so happy that President Anwar Sadat of Egypt had been killed. About a year ago, someone from the West Point Counterterrorism Center came to me and said, 
They wanted to know about Haqqani, but they also wanted to know about Rahman. He said, we're still trying to find him. It's the very beginnings of Al-Qaeda. I, I wrote my stories for the paper, wrote a book, became involved deeply with Afghanistan, five years, and then I couldn't take it anymore. I had to leave. National Geographic gave me an opportunity, then I traveled the world for Afghanistan, and I could not forget Afghanistan. Something drew me back. In 1996, I heard about this man named Osama bin Laden. I never heard about him in the early 1980s along the border, anywhere in Afghanistan at that time. Bin Laden flew from Sudan back to Jalalabad. He stayed with the very man, Khalas, who sent me in to stay with Haqqani. 2001, Bin Laden gives an interview to a Pakistani journalist named Miram uh, Ali, Ahmed, Ahmed Ali, Ahmed Amir, I think Ahmed Amir. The last interview he's ever given. And then he went and stayed with Yunus Khalas. And Yunus Khalas, what we heard, his sons took him up to Tora Bora. 2001, I'm walking around the block in my apartment and a woman comes up to me on, on September 9th downtown, everything had happened. And she didn't say hello. She didn't say hi, Jerry. She just said, Afghanistan. Can you come in to CBS tomorrow? I said, Afghanistan has just come roaring back into my life. So for the next month, I got hired by ABC television. They put me on television every night to talk about Afghanistan and in, ABC and in CBS radio. December 17th, my boss at CBS radio said, we're considering we need somebody to go to Afghanistan. ABC television was now asking me to start reading from a monitor. I knew what was coming. The, the other man who had sort of graying hair was retiring. I saw an opportunity was coming to me, what it would lead to me as a what kind of television presence in New York, and the money, and the purpose, and the establishment. And she said, I can't, my re editor, at the, or my producer, my boss at CBS Radio, can you go to Afghanistan? I said, yes. I went down in 2002 and talked to Yunus Khalas, the only journalist still ever allowed to see him. I wanted to find out about Haqqani and bin Laden. We got word that a young newspaper reporter had disappeared in Karachi. I volunteered to go down there and cover the death of Daniel Pearl. 2003, I went back to see Khalas again. He st I still, they still wouldn't let me alone. 2006, I'm going back and forth all this time for CBS. I go up in the mountains along the border to find out about where Ta Pat Tillman was killed. For the first time since in the 1980s, my hair is long, my beard is long. I'm wearing Afghan clothes. I can still do this. Nothing has changed. Everything is the same, except now I'm the enemy. When I was with Haqqani, I learned what Pashtun Wali in Islam came together. They saved my life three times. He protected me. I was a guest. Pana in Pashtun Wali. Always protect a guest. When I was up along the border trying to find out about Tillman, my guide said, Haqqani lives over there. Haqqani is over there in Miram Shah in Waziristan. How do I do this? I came back to New York made an arrangement with the book division of the New York Times. I kept it out of the publishing industry. Nothing was said anywhere in any part of New York. I let my hair grow longer and longer, my beard grow, and I went back to Afghanistan, and this time I didn't register with the embassy. I stayed away from journalists. I wore Afghan clothes, ate in Afghan restaurants, began to disappear into Pashtun culture as much as I could. For the next seven and a half, almost eight months, off and on, I lived along the border, playing with fire, trying to disappear as much as possible into the world of the Pashtuns, into the world of the Taliban. I fasted during Ramadan. I learned how to wash my hands, how to look at a man away, how to always practicing the language. I had to blend in. I felt 
I could do what no one else could do. I knew the leaders of the Taliban because once before I had been with them when they were our allies, the Mujahideen. And so what did I do? I went to the Senate Majority Leader of the Afghan Parliament and I told him I want to go deep into the tribal areas. He said, it's exceedingly dangerous, don't go. I knew it would take time. Finally, he introduced me to a member of the same network, the Khalas Haqqani Network, Mullah Omar's same network. And I said, I want to do, and I told him I want to go deep in the tribal areas. And I showed him my book, the text of which meant nothing, but the pictures meant everything. I was here with you before. And he said, I know a man. I know a Taliban leader. Trouble is, he assassinated a vice president of Afghanistan who happened to be the brother of my oldest friend in Afghanistan, the governor of Kabul. And I could not say anything to him. Finally, he crossed the border, back and forth, crossed the border each time, testing the Taliban, see if I could do it, an hour each time, three hours each time. They kept their word every single time. I was a guest. February 12, 2008. Well, to go back for one minute. Two days before, I called my father. My mother had died by then. Something inside of me said, I won't be talking to him for a long time. A, small, a producer for 60 Minutes was emailing me about a story that they want to do and could I help them. And I said no. And I gave them the name of another man named Michael Semple who works for the UN an Irishman. And I gave them another bit of information. I said, I'm going to go away for a while with a man named Abdullah. I don't know to this day why I said that. I punched the send button. February 12th, down to the border, Abdullah said, we're ready. I get down there. It's nighttime. My cell phone rings. The, body, the member of parliament, the former Mujahideen leader, he said, where are you? I said, I'm along the border. He said, come back. I said, why? The, Afga the Pakistani ambassador to Pakistan Afghanistan has been kidnapped in the tribal areas. There are soldiers everywhere. I looked over and I talked to my interpreter and I said, I should go back. What should we do? What should we do? Et cetera, et cetera. And he called Abdullah. And Abdullah said, there's no problem. I'm sending my man across. The next day, his man came across and I asked him, are the soldiers there looking for the, Afghan, uh, the Pakistani ambassador? If it's safe, we will protect you. Our heads will roll before years. Everybody had always protected me all my life. Nothing would happen. February 16th, early in the morning, in a guest house. We didn't stay where, where any other journalist would stay, any foreigners. We took separate stairways, separate stairs down to the street. The streets crowded with donkeys. Rickshaws, people, cars. I look around, is anybody watching? Cars waiting, get in the car. They headed down to a science. And we took off fast through the streets, heading west toward Kabul. Quick U-turn. The other way, is anybody watching us? No. And we passed the air base, the same base that bin Laden arrived in in 1996. Now, the principal air base, principal base, period, for the United States military along the Afghan-Pakistani border. We drove, time passes, the city breaks away, it begins to look like a desert, the driver turns off to the left, the road becomes, it was paved there, it's 90% of all material that comes in for NATO troops comes across this one single road into Afghanistan. We turn left, the road becomes gravel, the gravel becomes dirt, dirt becomes grass, grass becomes dust, dust becomes nothing. We pass a border post. They look at me and the others in the car and they wave us through. Can't tell by now what I am. We get to a cove. The driver, who has taken me three times into extremely dangerous areas, gets out of the car and we, we get small bags that we had. I have no cell phone, no ID, only Afghan clothes and a pair of old Timberland shoes that I wore. I was wearing cheap Chinese shoes, but I kept falling down the mountains when I would do it. And I said, no, I don't need to be that disguised. No one can tell what kind of shoes these are. I could buy these in Pakistan. Everything I wore was non-American. My bodyguard, my interpreter said, give money. 
give gas money to Ahmed, the driver. All oh, right, I haven't paid him for the last three days. And took out a thousand rupee note, twenty dollars. Pakistani money counts far more than Afghan money along the border. Pakistanis are more influential along the border than anybody else as they keep trying to win Afghans over, to push the border back. There is not a single Pashtun in all of Afghanistan. There's not one single legislature in the history of Afghanistan that has ever approved the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. This war, in a great many ways, is a war between the Punjabis, 70% of the Pakistani army is Punjabi, 80% of Pakistan bureaucracy is Punjabi. You talk to every Afghan along the border, he said it's the Punjabi ISI, the Punjabi army that is here. This is an ethnic war. The driver came up to me and gave him the money and his eyes were watery. And he said something I didn't understand. He mumbled it. And then he did something. He hugged me, which isn't so unusual. And then he did something no Afghan in 30 years has ever done. He kissed me on the cheek. I said, Holy Paman, go with God. I said, what I'm about to do is extremely dangerous. To this day, I don't know if that was a Judas kiss or not. We began to walk. My one bodyguard who had come across the border from Abdullah, me, and my interpreter. I was so happy to walk, to get out of the city, to move. We walk and we turn and we begin to climb. And we climb and we climb. All we have are two plastic sacks we bought in the bazaar. I spent days in the bazaar. Over a period, I don't know how many weeks, up and down the border. And I was with so many different Pashtuns trying to blend in. Can they see me? Can anyone tell that I'm, that I'm Pashtun? Can anyone tell that I'm not? I would practice constantly, always. The language, the way to look at somebody to try and blend in, thinking I could pass for somebody else. Finally, we're climbing, we're climbing up on a ridge. There's a man wearing a patu. It's this blanket-like shawl that you see on television. He's carrying a rifle. Men don't carry rifles in Afghanistan. The U.S. Army is, has, has, and NATO have pretty much disarmed everybody under different, different uh, proposals to try and bring people in. He hugged me. Welcome, he said in English. He took me into a house. He gave me water. We walked out the other edge of the house. There was a small paved road. There are no isolated paved roads in Afghanistan. I saw electric power lines overhead. There are no isolated electric power lines in Afghanistan. We drove, and I noticed that my two bodyguards are now armed. I didn't see where and how and when they were given the Kalashnikovs and the bandoliers and the bullets and the belt. He took me up into the mountains, asked me to take pictures. I looked out in the tribal areas. This boy, the British were tough to try and cross this, this desert area. And we went down to a river. There was a small boat waiting, a lawnmower type outboard motor puttering in the, in, the, in the river. We climbed in, we crossed. I said, this is all planned, everything is fine. We walked through a poppy field. And then my lead bodyguard hesitates. Wait a minute, he doesn't know where to go. Where are the 12 bodyguards that Abdullah said would be here? What's going on? Finally, we begin to climb. For the next eight hours, approximately, we climbed through the mountains. And my bodyguard said, you know, you're okay if for a gray beard, for an old man. No one comes here. And I said, I'm not an old man. I'm Call me Spingir. I said, I'm Nim Spingir. I'm half gray beard. I'm a half old. I can still do this. And I'm climbing through the mountains. And I remember that I used to run track as a boy. I can do this. I can keep up. And I would go through my mind of those races, not the ones I lost, but the ones that on occasion when I didn't. And I felt strong. And it's sundown. We're passing through an area that's not unlike the Grand Canyon, only much smaller, and you could hear our voices echo. Come through a valley, single file like a convoy. A bodyguard 20 yards ahead, another bodyguard about 15 yards behind him, then me and my interpreter lagging behind. I look up and I see a tinge of black. 
And I know, I know it's not a goat. I know it's not a sheep. I know what it is. It's a black turban. Mohammed wore a black turban. That is 15, 1600 years ago when he waged jihad. That is why the Taliban wear black turbans. That black tinge turned into a turban, which turned into a man who jumped over a rock, and he held a rocket-propelled grenade launcher, and he came running down the hill, and 12 men spread out, like Indians in an old Western movie, screaming down the mountain, can it, can it, can it, get down. And I froze, and I said, I'm dead. They surrounded me, my cotton mouth. I take off my vest, I had my three cameras, my notebook, my glasses, put them down to hide them. Irrational as that sounds. And I stood there waiting. I looked over and the man six feet away from me with that rocket grenade launcher pointed in my eyes. His eyes were like burning like coal. And the Taliban commander who was holding a walkie-talkie came up to me and he's talking to me and Pashto, where did you come from? I just came down from Kabul. Where are you going? We're going to Peshawar. Peshawar, first major city along the border. 30 years, no one has ever pronounced it other than Peshawar. Everybody, Afghan, foreigner, calls it Peshawar. It's pronounced Pekawar in this valley. Each valley in this area, it's not unlike a street, different, different street corners in Brooklyn, different accents. How can the CIA penetrate this? How can, you just, how can you make your way into a certain area and pass? First thing he said to me, you're not Pashtun. Well, of course I'm not, but I have to keep this fiction alive. Otherwise, they're going to kill me immediately. My, my interpreter said, he's Nuristani. Right, I'm Nuristani. The Nuristanis. I saw a Nuristani in one, in, in one place further up the mountain. He looked like he was from Wisconsin. The Nuristanis are said to be the descendants of one of the lost legions of Alexander the Great. You see a lot of fair hair, a lot of blue eyes. So what happens if the man with the rocket propelled grenade launcher starts talking to me in Nuristani? Before that, they rifle butts to my, t my, my lead bodyguard. The other bodyguard is up behind a rock. Why didn't they fire? Two small boys come up in it with a, with a uh, donkey, and the boy starts to cry. He's about 12 years old. And the Taliban comes in and says, ah, go. And I was never so jealous or so envious of anybody in my life. He's free. He can go. But maybe he'll, t he'll tell Abdullah. He'll tell these people. They'll come back and get the Taliban. We'll be okay. They took me deeper into the mountains. They put me down on a ridge. It's like California. The weather was Mediterranean, soothing. The wind was blowing. It was a gentle breeze. The sun was out, fading, just about gone. My back was still relatively straight. I was in complete shock. I'm looking west. I thought of my family and I thought of America, home. And then they put that black turban around my head and they pulled it tight and then they tied my hands and it was silent and I waited and I waited and I But I was in such shock that I just waited. I knew what was coming. They picked me up, took me further down the mountains. I fell a couple of times. They threw me into a car. And from then on, every single movement, are they going to kill me? Do they like me? Are they going to protect me? Are they going to save me? What? The smallest movement, do they, what are they going to do? They pulled me out of the car, threw me on the ground, and then started to go like this. Are they going to rape me? I had about... $1,500 U.S., Pakistani, and Afghan currency, they took it. We traveled for about two hours, hour and a half, actually. They took me out, separated me, put me in a car alone. We go higher and higher. Oh, they're going to kill me by myself. I accept that. That's just what's going to happen. Shock. We finally get to the top of the mountain. It's cold. Dogs are barking. Tied like this. They take me out, and I feel along. I know it's a baked mud wall. They take me into a room. They untie my blindfold, and I'm happy. My bodyguards are here. My interpreter is here. I'm not alone. The Taliban commander comes over, and he sits next to me. And he asks me, what is your name? 
And I told him, and it's not a Pashtun name, I told him my real name. And then he asked me, what is your father's name? My father? I am deep in the heart of Pakistan. I'm in the mountains of the tribal areas. And the first question they ask is, what is your father's name? The most important question you can ask in Afghanistan today is, who is your grandfather? The Taliban are trying to create, a, in their mind, a society not unlike that which the Prophet Muhammad created 15, 1,600 years ago in Medina, a pure egalitarianism, a world of Islam. And what do they ask me? They ask me what my father's name is, deep tribal structure, Pashtun Wali. For a second, I think I have a chance of living. Finally, the Taliban say, if you've been invited here, we will let you go. If you're a spy, we will judge you under Sharia. And then they leave, all 12 of them. They go into the next room. And then my two jailers come in. I didn't know it at the time. Short stock Kalashnikovs, mountain men. No turbans. And my lead bodyguard says, if they start to torture us or kill us, we have to kill them. Where's the safety on a Kalashnikov? I imagine. And then my, what am I going to do? And then my first bodyguard says, I'll take him. And the other bodyguard says, I'll take him. They're going to take these men. They're going to disarm them. They're going to kill them. We're going to pick up one of those rifles, and we're going to go next door, and three of us are going to kill 12 men. And I was in the Army a long time ago. In basic training, you have to put your rifle in the air and shout, kill, kill, kill. And I put mine down. I never wanted to kill anybody in my life. They took the lantern. They left. It's pitch black. We went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up at, when they came in before dawn bringing water for prayers, and it was the happiest and still is day of my life. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. We're going to investigate you. We're going to find out who you really are. We're going to investigate all of you. And who is this man, Abdullah, you talk about? Four nights later, they come back. They take each one of my bodyguards and my interpreter out, and I don't expect to see them again. They come back in, their heads are down. What do they do? Oh, they beat us a little, but we're okay. And then the Taliban all came in. It's about midnight, and the Taliban commander sat in front of me, and I sat three feet away from him, and his eyes were like cat's eyes, and he was smart, and I knew it, and he said, I have questions to ask you. And there weren't 12 men in the room. Now there are 20 men in the room, all of them armed, holding their, holding their lanterns, holding their flashlights, and then they began to interrogate me. Where are you from? Why the cameras? You say you're not a spy. On and on and on and on and on and on. I have to give the speech of my life tonight to save my life. And I have to save the life of the men I brought with me. It's my responsibility. Two hours later, I'm exhausted. The Taliban commander gets up. He looks at me cold. He shakes my hand partly. And he walks out. Did I survive? Am I going to be okay? Did I do it? Silence, silence, silence. And then he walks in. And this time, three men walk in behind him. They're wearing sunglasses, army fatigue jackets, Kalashnikovs, banana clips filled with bullets in their, jack in their pockets. And they come behind me. And I know what's coming. The Taliban commander comes up to me. He's like this. His eyes are cold. I have a small Sony um, CBS camera. How do I turn this on? Oh. 
I'm going to help you film my own execution. And he starts to film me. And I see my interpreter writhing on the floor in utter despair. I'm no longer in shock. I know. I've been here now a while, four days. It's all different now. I don't have the courage or the strength to keep my back straight. My face is down. I'm looking at the ground. My back is down. I can't lift it up. It's like lifting lead. Minutes pass. Minutes and minutes and minutes. Finally. Finally. I know I have to face it. And I begin to think of my father and my brother and my sister. I'm not married. I don't have children. I would never do this. That. I thought of my nephews and my nieces. And I thought of Daniel Pearl. I was the next foreign journalist kidnapped in Pakistan after Daniel Pearl, almost six years to the day. I thought of Nicholas Berg. And finally, 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 I looked him in the eye. OK, OK, OK. And I'm shaking, shaking inside. Finally, it ends. I go outside. I slump over. Minutes pass, and then they come back in. Only this time, they stand closer. They take my hat off. They put the rifle to my temple. Kalashnikov with barrels cut like that, I discovered. And the Taliban commander's eyes are angry, and he's filming, and the place is silent. And the man behind me goes into his pocket into the, you've seen these videos. The knife is this long. We've all seen that on television. I've seen them slaughter sheep with it. And like this. And I'm 100% certain. But I looked him in the eye. Okay. Okay. And I was shaking so hard. But I didn't want to be a coward on television when the world saw me beheaded. I wanted to die with dignity. I knew that my brother and sister and that everybody would watch, and I had to do it for them. It ended. They walked out. I stumbled over. The lights were, the lanterns were gone, the flashlights were gone. I put this quilt over my head and I cried for about a split second, two or three or four seconds. It just came out. I could never, ever cry in front of them. From that time on, my everybody in the room was jailed. Oh, excuse me, it was chained except me. I looked around for blood on the walls. There was a snake skin in the, the, uh, in the roof above us, which was made of branches. We weren't allowed out but three minutes at night. They gave me a sweater. They gave me a pen. They gave me a, a notebook. And they said, if you hope to survive, you're going to have to convert. And they eventually gave me three books on Islam. And I would very secretly at night write down my notes of everything that transpired. And I would do all that I could every single day to win them over. My bodyguards and I and my interpreter began to become territorial. Some of the people began to take more food. We became enemies. We became primal. Why did you lead us here? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You're responsible for this. You're responsible for that. Time passed, and my interpreter began to stop translating for me. One day, they took one of my bodyguards away, and he came back four days later, and he was no longer chained. What's going on? He's acting awfully arrogant over there as he prances around the room. One day, the jailer said, there was a German kidnapped in Afghanistan, 
He was released for $50,000. Why so little? Maybe they took his kidneys and sold them. Sir Jerry, he has good Western kidneys. That's it. This is not going to happen. Nobody is coming into this room with a satchel and a syringe, and you're not going to tie me down, and you're not going to cut out my kidneys. That's not going to happen. I began to pace back, and he left. We had a string, we had a, what a wire that we found. I said, we take that wire and we strangle him, maybe, or we tie him up. And every single minute of every single day, you look, how can, I, how can I dig it myself out of here? How can I escape? I could never see the sun. I could never see outside. Which way is west? Which way is east? We had to pray that way. Therefore, that's towards Mecca. That means that's southwest. How do we, if I get out, do I go this way over the mountains, et cetera, constantly every single minute? Now, nothing matters. We're not, I'm not going to allow this torture. For the first time, my entire time there, I was not a victim. I felt strong. The men in Flight 93 went down in the absolute best way. This is what I thought of. This is what we're going to do. We're allowed out three minutes every night. This night, my bodyguard, who was no longer chained, stayed out for 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Why so long? And then the jailer came in, and he said, if you try to escape, I will come at you like a dog. Now I can't trust anybody. My bodyguard is turned against me. Who can I trust? I'm all alone in this place, and I'm never going to get out of here alive. Every single day, there was a predator overhead. Is that predator there for me? Or is, does the US government know about this? Is there hope? Or is that there to kill the Taliban as they kept coming and going on the way back and forth to Afghanistan? Every minute, every day, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Finally, I had to speak into a microphone. My name is, I am a captive of, I have not been harmed by, and so forth and so on. To say that into a microphone is deeply humiliating. The shame. I have been kidnapped by the Taliban. I am a prisoner in the mountains. I wanted to go to the heart of the Taliban. I wanted to find out about Osama bin Laden. I wanted to do what no one else could do. I felt I could do it with my contacts. I was going to get to Akani, and here I am, the shame. And as the days passed, I said, wait a minute. I have a notebook. I have paper. They're now letting me even take notes in front of them. I remembered what my mentor at the New York Times, Mike Kaufman, said so many years ago. Don't worry about the story. It will come to you. It's come to me. And so I would sit in the corner, and I would turn my back, and no one was looking, and I would write. And I would take notes, which ultimately became this book. Finally. One day, well, it was actually on the 45th day, the Taliban commander came in and he said, congratulations on escaping death. You said you weren't going to harm me. They never touched me. They never laid a hand on me. They fed me. You are our guest, Pashtun Wali. What do you mean your guest? This is a prison. We will protect you. We will protect you from other Taliban who will want to take you and sell you and kill you. They put a woman's, it's called a burqa in the West, called Shadari in Afghanistan, over me. I said, you're going to be with your wife tonight in Jalalabad. I don't have a wife. They put me back in a car with the others, came back to a village, and then we'd be, began to walk, and I was too tired, and lay down, and I saw a man behind me. He was fumbling with a sack. I said, oh, that's the suicide bomber. The Taliban commander said, I'm sending a suicide bomber to the prisoner exchange. 
I had to listen for hours and hours and hours to Taliban recruitment tapes and Taliban suicide recruitment tapes. Become so inured to death. And these tapes, the, the Pashtuns sing of Pashtun poetry, Pashtun history, Pashtun geography, and they sing of their mothers, never their fathers. Finally, we're passed out from one village to the next, and no one comes close, and they all stare at us. We're the Taliban. A light flicks on. We pass these men. Well, they don't come to us yet. We get to a border area and out of the darkness. I can't keep going anymore. I fall down. I keep falling. So we're going to let you go here. We know who you are. We know all about you. We know who your families are. They had the phone numbers. I had a rifle to my head when I had to give up the numbers in another time. Go. And we stumbled on, and I fell, and I fell, and we kept going. Another group came out. We finally made our way across two rivers. A truck came down to pick me up, drove on to another place. I saw a lantern going like this in the road, like you see on train tracks. Oh, no, the Taliban. Got out of the truck. I wanted to lean against the truck. Americans lean against trucks. I kept to stand up. And then a man came out out of the darkness, and he showed me a small card that said CBS, and my knees buckled. Another man came out with rifles. We went through other transfers to U.S. military base. The CIA took over, passed to the FBI, back to the U.S. Embassy. The embassy, the FBI brought me back to New York. I'm sitting in New York, JFK, holding my pants up, skinny as can be. People all around are looking as we pass through customs. Who in the world is this? It's the police and all these other plainclothes men are all around. And the man, my body, one of the FBI agents says, you're home, Jerry. You're safe. I'm fine. And another FBI agent across the hall, across the table says, when you go home tonight, you will find three messages from the Taliban on your answering machine. Please tell us what they mean and who they are. But we advise you not to say anything for a few, or use, pick up the phone for a few days. He's telling me two things. We've been through your apartment, and the Taliban have followed you back here. The last death threat I got was about 10 months ago. The emails are still monitored. My sister-in-law is worried about her children. People in my building were afraid that with all the F 20 FBI agents going through Jerry's apartment that I brought the property values down and that somehow Al-Qaeda is going to make difficult life difficult for them. After the disaster, it still goes on. But, but, as people have asked me many times, I never wanted to be anywhere else. And a long time ago, when I was here at the University of Oregon, I wanted to go off on a great adventure, and I didn't know why. That adventure led me into the world of journalism. Journalism is a form of exploration. All journalists at one time pick a particular subject, and mine, like the story, came to me. What the Taliban gave me, in addition to life, was the knowledge that I could look death in the eye, a sense of courage. In fact, my message is that the Taliban, our former, who were once the Mujahideen, are today our enemies. Maybe, as so many journalists who have interviewed me and we've had these discussions, how do we know that they didn't want to kill you? How do we know? They didn't, did they? Pashtunwali. 
They protected me. There's a poem that goes, it's an Arab first said it, T.S. Eliot picked it up, in the end of all our travels, we return to the point from which we started and we see it all clearly for the first time. And I see very clearly how it was 40 years ago this month that I started out on this great adventure. I've come back to this very point to tell you, and to tell every journalism student here, you follow that dream, there's no blueprint. It led me on this long journey into the world of Afghanistan, led me into the world of journalism, and the Taliban gave me the opportunity to come back and tell you the story, and thank God they let me live. And now I have a responsibility, and this is the final point. Daniel Pearl's father wrote a le an article in the Wall Street Journal a year ago in which he said, my son has died in vain. I'm alive today because of Daniel Pearl. A great many people went to a great deal of trouble to save my life and to protect and to prevent, and this is the exact words, the next Daniel Pearl. So my responsibility is to talk about the Taliban, to talk about the war, and that I have now, so many years later, discovered why so many years ago I went to the anthropology class and went on a long journey. Thank you for listening. All right, I talked too long, but thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions? And don't hesitate. You can stamp the microphone or, or not. Any questions? Yes. Um, no. Uh, my interpreter is one of the main men who's called most, who's made most of the 50 phone calls I've received. The government has asked me not to talk to anybody. When I get the emails, I don't respond to them. And it's to protect me because we don't know who's behind them and what they really want. It's an ongoing case. It's a capital crime. And the FBI is extremely limited in what it can do, but it's responsible for all kidnappings of all Americans everywhere in the world. And it's trying to do what it can. It's important is for me not to want revenge, not to be angry. The, the way in which I found this interpreter, I couldn't find any, I had one, and then no one would do this. No one would cross the border. When I went, it was a former minister of education, a man I knew from the 1980s. I went to him and I said, I'm looking for an interpreter. There was a young woman there, two cell phones ringing, jeans, carrying on like, like we were friends in New York. What kind, of, what kind of Afghan woman is this? She grew up in a refugee camp in Peshawar. In the book, I call her Shala. She called me a few days later. She said, I have somebody I want you to meet. It took a long time, but that became my interpreter. Both the jailer, when they were interrogating me, and the FBI, when I got out. They came to New York, and they're constantly for a while they're wanting to know things, want to know about Shala. Is that where it started? I don't know. There was a the U.S. ambassador to, uh, to Pakistan um, who later went on to become ambassador to Iraq in 2007 when he was just leaving, and I was in a briefing at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, said through his spokesperson, I didn't talk to him, his name is Ryan Crocker, because he'd already left, he'd just gone a couple days before to Iraq. He said, Pakistan is the murkiest country I've ever been in in my life. And I can tell you stories about bin Laden and that whole thing. It's so incredibly murky. What I returned with 
besides my life was humility. Yes, someone else. Uh, if my religious beliefs Okay, what are my religious beliefs now? I was captured by Wahhabis. Wahhabi, the British called them Hindustani fanatics. They led the fight against the British when they were there. Bin Laden is Wahhabi. Most people along the border are Diobani. They're different. The Wahhabis are the, the strike force in Islam. That's the 9-11 hijackers were all Wahhabis. Um, as we had to listen to the Taliban tapes and further and further, I drew, I knew I had to find a way to stay alive and not lie. And I drew closer and closer to the world of Islam. And then one day they said, when you're finished with your prayers, you can pray on your own. And I found that in that the difference between that life and normal life is you have time to escape to your work, to your family, some sort of entertainment. Wherever you are, or even in prison, you can go outside. Wherever you are in the world, no matter if it's Ethiopia or Uganda or New York, there we couldn't do anything. It became darker and darker and darker and darker, and I began, I was increasingly alone. And I found myself praying to the God of my youth. And then the FBI said to me one day, a month later, or a month or so after I got out, people become religious in prison and atheists afterwards. And therein lies the key. Yeah, I still pray. I believe in God. Yes. It affects it completely. It's not just government. Now, the government is not against me. The government is monitoring the emails because they, and I was told this by the F, an FBI guy about a month ago, it's because they're still trying, there's so much that we don't know. And as we all know here, the war is not ending and it's getting increasingly murky, increasingly complex, and we're trying to get out. They, they monitor this, but I am completely free to do whatever I want, but I'm not free at all. Because I just read an article, and I mentioned this to somebody in Harper's Magazine about Mark Twain, where Teddy Roosevelt did something for him, and he was never able to say anything against Teddy Roosevelt. I, am, I work with one. I was forced to keep silent for two years. Many people were involved. Lives are at risk. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't earn any money. I had to, I couldn't talk to my, I could only talk to my own family. I was forced only to talk to the, to the government for hours each week. I finally, when that finally ended, I realized that I had one hand behind my back, that I could not talk freely. I could not write freely. I could not speak freely. I work for CBS, I have a, I have an, a tie to, to CBS, and they use me very, very rarely. They realize how complicated this is. It has to change, and it's going to take a while. There's an old saying, it's pop psychology, I've learned. It's attributed, again, to Nietzsche. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's false. It takes a long time. But you have to learn, to, you have to ultimately quit becoming a victim. There are four other people who have been kidnapped. John Selecki, Sean Langan. Sean Lang works at the BBC. John, John Selecki, who was a U worked for the UN. David Roden, New York Times, and myself. Thank goodness we can talk. We work these things out. You have to go in a different direction for a while. And I can't go back to Afghanistan yet. It's too marked. So you're tied behind. Your, hand is, your hands are tied. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Pardon? And? Oh. Um, 
I don't believe for a second that Osama bin Laden is hiding along the border. Um, which the tribal areas are the size of New Jersey, the size of Connecticut. Pakistan keeps, and the United States keep killing the number three uh, Al Qaeda leader, but we never seem to capture or kill number one or number two. Um, the a thing called Tabar Wali, which is part of the tribal code, which is called cousin warfare, where the Talib, where Pashtuns compete with one another for women, for property, for 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 money. There was no w one day my jailer came into the room, armed to the teeth. He said, "Thank goodness I can be here with you. My relatives are here tonight." One day, we, and we had a small place the size of this podium, which we used for wash for prayers, and it was a bathroom, and wa we could no longer send water out. The jailer said, "We've got a problem." No, I've got a problem. Because the next door neighbor, the water was flowing out about 12 feet away and eroding part of the wall. Therefore, we had to pour all the water on the floor and that pit became a cesspool for weeks and weeks. How can it, because he was afraid that his neighbors would know that he had prisoners in his, his house, this jail. And there were chains on the floor. It was, it was a jail and we were not the first people there. How can bin Laden hide in a world like that? It's impossible. The CIA will talk about this is the most difficult terrain in the world. The Himalayas are difficult. These aren't difficult. The United States, according to every Pashtun along the border, the United States is at war with the Pashtun nation. We keep talking about the hammer and anvil approach. It's the Pakistani army against trying to squeeze the Pashtun nation. The United States on one hand and Pakistan here in Pakistan on the other. I believe that the United States is frightened to death of nuclear arms falling into the hands of the wrong people. They're trying to, they're frightened to death of Pakistan dismembering. There is not an Afghan, a Pashtun alive that wants Pakistan to stay in one country. The border to them is not the border. It's almost 180 miles further east in the Indus River. This is a border war or as the ambassador to the, to the U.S. told me, and the Emirate, this is a brother war. The war that we're fighting is, is, I don't think neither Bush nor Obama have been straight with the United States on why we are really there. Is it the soft containment of China? Is it to surround Iran? Is it to keep Pakistan alive? We never fought the Taliban under President Bush. It's morphed into a war against the Taliban under President Obama. Why are we doing this? No one knows. I'm not entirely certain what American foreign policy is. Senator Lin Lindsey Graham, Republican from South Carolina, who is a, a reserve officer in the Air Force, has talked, and it's in print, about the need to establish permanent Air Force bases in Shindan, it's near the border, Balgram in the north, Mazda Sharif in Kandahar. In the Air Force, it is said, wants these. But why? Maintain overflight surveillance of Russia, China, Iran. What is the truth? I don't know the truth. But I don't believe for a second, or as my jailer said, Osama bin Laden is being kept by an institution. And every tribal chief and every common man along the border said, Mullah Omar was willing to destroy his country, willing to destroy his, his family, his government, in order to protect under Pashtun Wali Osama bin Laden. But he is now too big to hide. We cannot keep him. Somebody has him, and it's certainly not in a cave, some institution, somewhere. I think it's very, very murky. I really do. Anybody else? Yes? There's no, there's no proof of that. There's no proof of that, is there? How do people, people monitor al Swahari by monitoring his family in Egypt? There hasn't been a funeral for al Swahari. There hasn't been any unusual movement in the al Swahari family. The same would apply to the bin Laden family. That's my feeling on this. 
and others. There's something else. I don't believe for, I personally don't believe for a second that he's dead. I certainly don't know where he is, and I certainly didn't get close. But I don't believe he's dead. But again, we haven't heard from him in years, have we? Jerry, thank you for a, 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 an amazing, an amazing lecture, an amazing discussion, um, and I think an inspiring one as well. Uh, I thank you all for coming, and uh, invite you. I believe that there is a reception to follow, but I'm not quite sure where. In the lobby. In the lobby. So there is a there is a reception in the lobby. Again, thank you all for being here, uh, and and enjoy the conversation. <laughs>